Hello, everyone, and welcome to the video podcast series, Lifestyle by Design. I'm your host, Margaret Wilshire, and my guest tonight is Gary Ant. Gary, welcome. Thanks for having me, Margaret. I am super excited to have Gary on the show tonight. Tonight, we are going to talk about living a fearless, bold life, stepping into your dreams and just going all out. Gary is a travel photographer. He's an entrepreneur. He's a writer, a speaker, and a world traveler. But most of all, Gary is a very, very brave man in my eyes. So welcome, Gary. Hey, thanks for having me. So Gary, can you tell me a little bit about what you did? Now, I know that in 2007, you sold your business and you sold your home. I sold the business before that, okay. uh, just to give a little background. So I had a very early internet company. I started it back in 1994. Okay. And what, what I did is back then, um, it was very, very early. This was before Netscape even, when I started Ooh. it. Okay. And most, the, the internet at that time was all static HTML pages, meaning literally just a page of HTML. And I had a, a high school or a college roommate, and his brother said, well, you should create this product to make it easy to hook up a database to a website. And so he created this product, which eventually became uh, what's known as Cold Fusion, and today it's offered by Adobe. Oh, wow. And so I started making websites that hook up databases. Now today that's very common, WordPress, everything is, is run off a database. Twitter, Facebook, all that. But at the time, this is, I guess this is more than 20 years ago now, uh, very little was. And so I started doing websites, I began doing some publishing sites for newspapers, uh, for brokerage houses, all sorts of different things. And I sold that business in 1998, okay. before the dot-com bubble burst. And um, I can the company I sold it to was an international company and ended up becoming the uh, consulting wing of British Telecom. And I kind of convinced them to send me on a trip around the world to talk to all their field offices about doing application development on the internet. And that was the first time I'd ever really traveled anywhere. So in 1999, they sent me on a three-week whirlwind tour, and I went to Japan, uh, Taipei, Singapore, Paris, Frankfurt, Brussels, and London. And it was the first time I'd ever really been anywhere. I, I'm not, I didn't grow up in a well-traveled family. Um, it, you know, as I like to tell people, I didn't even see salt water until I was 21 years old. Wow. Um, and, and that kind of got me the bug. And after I sold the business, I started some other businesses, and I didn't know what to do with my life. And it always came back to travel because that initial trip left such an impression on me that I just sort of made the decision back in 2005 that I would travel around the world for a year or two. So I sold my house and, and one year became two, became four, became eight, and now I'm into my 10th year of doing it. Okay. So what specifically about traveling is it that you love? You're always experiencing something new, something different. Um, you're always learning about something. You know, one of the things I noticed very early in my travels is that I could not tell you what I did most days before I started traveling, especially after I sold my business. One day kind of bled into the next. But I could tell you everything I did while I was on the road. Every single place left an impression on me. And that's, that's just, you know, most people, they get up, they go to work, and they do the same routine over and over and over, and you can't really tell one day apart from the next. And so one of the things I noticed is, yeah, I could remember most of my life. It was leaving an impact on me, and before it really wasn't. Hmm. Okay, that's very true. Most people do spend their days exactly the same and they complain about the same things and they do the same things because they are not living their dreams and they're not passionate about what they're doing. So you found a joy and passion in traveling. Could you tell me before when you were in the phase of I'm gonna when you made the decision I'm gonna take a year or two to travel were you did you have any fears or reservations about doing so 
No. And uh, this, you know, the, the, I've heard people say, oh, it's so courageous what you did. And I never thought of it that way. Wow. Um, I've never, I don't know, the fear has never really been something which has motivated me. And when I made the decision to do it, I just made the decision. And then after that, it was simply a matter of, okay, how do I make it happen? And it took a while. It took about 18 months uh, from the decision to travel to being able to sell my house, uh, tie up all sorts of loose ends. You know, um, I sold my house in what was not really the best market for selling a house. Okay. Um, 2007 was just before like the market collapsed in 2008, so the market was still pretty soft. And yeah, so, but I was never at any point scared of it. I've never, yeah, it, maybe I'm just different that way, but it was not something that really concerned me that much. Okay. As Now you said you grew, you're from Wisconsin, yes. and you said your family wasn't well-traveled, they didn't travel a lot. Um, but did you have dreams as a child of traveling? My dad used to get a subscription to National Geographic. And I think that's where the ideas for a lot of this stuff started. I would, I would read about these different places. I was very good at geography. I could, I, I still can. I have the ability, I can name every country in the world off the top of my head. Wow. Um, but I had never done any of this stuff myself. And it just dawned on me that, you know, maybe this would be something I, I wanted to do. And when I, when I got that first taste of travel, I think that really, you know, it really, even though it was three weeks, it stuck with me for years. And that's, I think, what kind of really drove me to the point of, of making that decision. Okay. What was one of the first, what was the first country that you went to when you decided to embark on this journey? Uh, the goal was roughly go west. So I, I lived in uh, Minneapolis at the time sold my house, I went, I rented a car one way, drove it to Dallas, met a friend, took a train to LA, then I flew to Hawaii. And I was in Hawaii for a couple weeks and I learned how to scuba dive while I was there. And then I went to Tahiti. Uh, from Hawaii, I went to Easter Island, then I went to the Cook Islands, I went to New Zealand, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, American Samoa, back to Fiji. Wow. Um, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, the Solomon Islands, Nauru, Kiribati, back to Fiji, then to Hawaii, the Marshall uh, Islands, Micronesia, Guam, Northern Marianas Islands, Palau, the Philippines. So it roughly took me half a year to cross the ocean. Wow. And I kind of made that up as I go, as I went along, based on just what the flights were and things like that. Wow. You know, and you had no fear at all? You know, when I, when I landed in Tahiti for the first time, and Tahiti is not really that exotic of a destination. It's a very popular, it's a very popular tourist attraction, right? I should say that. It gets a lot of tourists. So it's not like I'm off into the, some remote village in the mountains in the Andes or something. Um, but they don't speak English, right? It, it's a French territory. And so, yeah, that was a bit, you know, here I am by myself in the middle of the ocean in a place that doesn't speak English. And it took me a while to, uh, to, to get accustomed to that. And now you could drop me in anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. And I, I could I'd figure it out. Uh, but yeah, but I wasn't really scared. It was just like, okay, how am I going to do this? And it was just a series of, okay, how do I do this type things? And then figuring everything out one at a time. So I guess, you know, I'm not trying to push the idea of like fear, but for me, I think, you know, following your blog and listening to your podcast, I, I might be vicariously living through you because some of those, some of the, your adventures are a bit scary for me. I'm like, wow, could I do that? It's like, <laughs> you know, so I, I applaud you. And it's interesting to hear that, you know, that you weren't afraid. You just, you would go. It didn't. It wasn't even a, a factor in your decision making, and you just would figure it out along the way. That's really great. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not dumb, so I'm not going to go somewhere like I'm not going to be going to Syria right now, or Libya, any place <laughs> where there's a war going on. I have no desire to be a martyr to the cause of travel. Um, so you, you use common sense. Um, what you find out is a lot of times our fears are based on 
what little we know. So when we hear about a country in the news, we only, we only hear the bad things. If something good happens, we just don't hear about it at all. So most of our notions of the rest of the world are all negative because we only hear negative things. And so you get to these places and you realize, well, they're just, they're just people, right? They go about their daily lives, they're buying food and cooking and working and just like anybody else. Uh, and that every day, you know, right now as we're talking, there are people in Baghdad. Now, when I say Baghdad, you think, oh, wars and car bombings and all this stuff, but there's still a couple million people who live there every day and they, they work and they eat and they, they do things. Now, to be certain, uh, it's, it's probably a very dangerous place to visit right now. I'm not saying you should go to Baghdad, but I'm just saying right now, you know, most people are not being murdered around the world. And when, once you can, you know, rationalize that, you can realize the world is actually not as dangerous as we make it out to be. Oh. It's pretty pro profound, and that's, um, I'm glad you said that. You know, it puts, it, it shifts my perspective on a lot of things. So thank you for that. Well, let me, let me give you an example that I always give. Okay. Um, there's been some bad things happening in Mexico with, like, drug lords and things like that. And people hear that and they say, oh, Mexico is dangerous. Problem is, Mexico is a really big country. And most of what the bad things that are happening are actually near the U.S. border in the north. If you go to the Yucatan, the crime rate down there is basically the same as Finland, which is to say there's not a lot of crime. We understand the place where we live, so we know, okay, maybe there's a neighborhood you don't go to or certain areas, and we know that. So when we hear of a local murder, we don't think, oh my gosh, I'm going to move. We think, oh, that was over there, or that was at a different time. A good example is when there was the uh, bombing at the Boston Marathon a few years ago. Now, this was in Boston. If you had called up a friend in Los Angeles and said, hey, I just heard there was a bombing in America, are you all right? We would laugh at that because L.A. is way far away from Boston. But if you're not familiar with the United States, you would think, oh, there was a bombing in America. And you'd equivocate the whole thing. And that's exactly what we do with a lot of these places. Most countries are pretty big, right? I mean, they're this, you know, they're the size of a large state or something at, at, at a minimum. But we don't know the, the subtleties and the differences and the regions or just the size of it. And so we tend to say, like, you know, there was just a, a terrorist attack recently in uh, Belgium. There was one in France. Not, and, and so people are saying, oh, well, I'm not going to Europe. When in reality, it's, you know, even if you factor in those things, the odds of being killed by someone in Europe are far less than the United States. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. So you have now traveled to all seven continents, over 175 countries. You visited all, the United, all over the United States, every single state and Canadian province. There are a few more countries left on the list, right? I think there's a total of, is it 193 technically countries, okay. the UN? The, the 175 is countries and territories. So that okay. includes things like Puerto Rico, French Polynesia, Antarctica, Gibraltar, wow. things like that, which are territories of other countries. Uh, according to the UN list, I've now been to 111 countries. Really? Uh, yeah. And there's, a, there's some real obvious ones I've not been to. So I've been to Vanuatu and St. Kitts and Nevis and Liechtenstein, but I have not been to mainland China, Russia, Brazil, Jamaica. Uh, there's some real obvious ones I haven't been to. So there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit for me to visit. Okay. Any particular reason why? Or are you just making your way slowly but surely? You know, there, no. I, I guess I, I do have kind of a fascination with little countries. I always kind of have. Um, the ones that people only see at the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, and then they go, where is that? And then they never think about it again for another four years. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's why I went to places like the Solomon Islands, and uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Samoa, actually, and I really yeah. enjoyed it. And to understand you know, why, why these countries exist, how they exist, uh, how do they get by with small populations and small land masses, and, I've always found those places fascinating, and quite frankly, they're easier to visit 
in many respects. You know, you could go to Samoa and spend a week there and see everything. Wow. Okay. And you can't even dent. Like, I just went to India for the first time uh, last month, and man, I just scratched the surface. That country is huge, not just physically, but there's, there, there's so much, you know, there's so many languages spoken in the country and the cultural diversity and all the different aspects of it that it's, you know, it would, you could take a long time just exploring India. Okay. Did you go to any popular parts of India or did you go to less popular parts? Uh, so I went to two parts. I went to Kerala, which is in the south, which is probably not, I wouldn't say it's an unpopular part but uh, of the country, but I think most people will probably go to Delhi and they go to Agra, the Taj Mahal. And I, I also did that, uh, get the obvious stuff out of the way. That's usually my advice to people when they visit a popular place for the first time, like they go to Paris for the first time. My advice is day one, get it all out of your system. Go to the Eiffel Tower, go to the Arc de Triomphe, go to, no, just go to all the stereotypical places day one. And then you can hang out at cafes and, and kind of do some other stuff. Okay. I will take that travel tip. So I noticed that there are a lot of firsts with you. Like you have three dimples. I do. <laughs> Can we see your three dimples? Oh, I, yeah, I guess I can. So I think I got uh, two there. Okay. And then one there. And one there. Okay. It's pretty amazing. But as I was reading, you know, the information, I was like, wow. You know, I always made fun of splunking, but I never met anyone who splunked. And you are the first splunker that I've met. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm hardcore, but, you know, and I haven't gone out of my way to do it, but for whatever strange reason, I've been to a lot of caves. <laughs> I just, in the course of my travels, I've been to a lot of caves in a lot of countries. And uh, when we, I was in Malaysia, in, in Borneo, there's this place called Mulu National Park, which is one of my favorite parks in the world. And they have this enormous cave system, including some of the largest caves in the world. And, uh, yeah, we got to put on the helmets and the lights and the... Uh, go climbing and crawling around in the caves. Okay. Would you say that you're an adrenaline junkie? No. Um, I've never been skydiving. I don't do the stuff that you normally associate with Red Bull and Mountain Dew and a lot of those <laughs> things. Um, I've been bungee jumping twice. Both times I felt like the first time I wanted to do it to say I did it. And it was, it was a kind of a rainy day and it was me and this Indian family and I was in I was in New Zealand, and they had two little. Well, I think one girl was like thirteen, and the other was fifteen or something. And they're both really tiny, and they did it in order of weight. So they went first, and then I'm like, if a thirteen year old girl bungee jumps, I can't kick <laughs> out. So I had to do it, and then I did it again. The next time I went to New Zealand, off the the Harbor Bridge in Auckland, but I don't even remember it because it's like it's over so quick. And it's like losing your virginity. It's just done. And <laughs> next thing you know, you're hanging upside down. And that was it. But I, I mean, like I, I, I do scuba diving every so often. Uh, I've done over 100 dives around the world. But I don't, it's not really an adrenaline sport. Um, I've, I've done, I, I suppose if you just look at a list of things, like I've been in a Formula One race car. But again, you're just kind of a passenger. You're not really... <laughs> Your list here are things that, very, you know, the average person won't do it. They'll stand back and watch others do it. I landed on an aircraft carrier last year, um, which was kind of fun. Um, in The weird thing is most people who work on an aircraft carrier, if you're in the Navy, have never landed on an aircraft carrier. Because <laughs> there's too many people on the aircraft carrier. They can't get them on and off by air. They have to wait till they dock. Gary, I don't know. I, I think you might be an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> this is all like really amazing stuff that the average person will not do. You know, can you tell me a little bit about you landed and were, you were landed and you were launched from a nuclear aircraft carrier? Right. So last year, uh, the Navy and is this yeah, this was, oh yeah, so this was um, last year, 
the Navy has a program where they invite journalists and other notable people to uh, visit their ships. And I'd been talking to them for a couple of years, but I was never able to do it because of my schedule. And finally, I was able to do it last year. So I was invited to uh, spend an evening on the USS Harry S. Truman. Uh, they were in doing maneuvers in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, we flew a small, it's called a, I want to say it's a C4 Greyhound. It's a small supply plane that brings people and stuff onto the aircraft carrier, but you land and take off just like a jet fighter. I mean, the same way. You do the, the tail hook landing where they grab you, and then you get catapulted off the plane by a, a catapult using the exact same one that the, uh, the fighter jets use. And you, the acceleration when you take off is so great. You're sitting backwards that your body is thrust um, forward, and I didn't black out, but I almost blacked out, and I, after we were up in the air, I leaned to the guy next to me, and I was like, yeah, I almost blacked out, and he was like, yeah, so did I, because it's, you're going from basically zero to 200 miles an hour wow. in like two or three seconds. Wow. Okay. So, what were you thinking before you made that decision? Well, I don't know. I just thought it'd be cool to go see an aircraft carrier. Okay. And I'm, I'm from the Midwest. We don't have aircraft carriers. <laughs> so there are certain people, like if you were in San Diego or, you know, certain parts of the East Coast, you might have at least seen one or something. I'd never even seen an aircraft carrier, let alone landed on one. So I, I'd never even been in a, a military facility, to be honest. They don't have them in Wisconsin. We, we have no military bases. So I was curious by all that. When the invitation came, I was like, sure, I'd do it. Wow. You just keep amazing me more and more. You know, um, you wrote out the tsunami in Hawaii. Yeah, again, that sounds impressive, but in reality, so if you remember back when uh, the tsunami hit Japan, they had the earthquake, and so I forget what year that was. That was 2010, nine, around there. But anyways, I was in Hawaii when it happened, and all the tsunami warnings start going off, and I was in Lahaina in Maui, which if, if you look at the, the way the islands are configured, is really one of the safest places to be in Hawaii because you're protected by all the other islands and whatnot. And the locals, they had been through these tsunami warnings before, and it's unlike, say, a tornado or some other natural event or an earthquake in that you have warning. And so we had several hours, and I started talking to people on Twitter that were between us and Japan. So I started talking to some people in Guam and some other people on other Pacific Islands who I had, I had met from my travels. And I had just asked them, like, well, what's happening? Someone in Guam said, uh, the water rose to, like, my ankles to my knees. That was what happened. So there was, I kind of figured out beforehand there was no tsunami. A lot of the Europeans that were there, they, people have this notion that a tsunami is, like, this enormous wave that's going to, like, crush everything. That's not what it is. It's like a tide that just keeps going up, 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 up. And... Um, they, they, they fled to the hills. They went into the inland and took for the evening and stuff, and the locals didn't care. And this one guy at the place I was staying, he actually took his camcorder and went to the harbor, climbed a tree, and <laughs> recorded the whole thing. <laughs> and basically, the water went up like about three feet, maybe not even, and then it went back down, and that was it. Okay. I mean, being there where you were, you really did not have a choice. You know, that wasn't something you cho chose to do. It was a force of nature. No, but it was just interesting being there and, you know, this a big event was happening and, you know, historically Hawaii has been hit by tsunamis, so it is something that they're concerned about. Um, I, I mentioned Samoa earlier. A couple years after I was in Samoa, they got hit with a really bad tsunami and the, um, the downtown area of Pongo Pongo in American Samoa was really hit really bad. And so it's a, it is a, something to be concerned about in the Pacific. It's just that that particular night, Thankfully, nothing happened. Okay. Those events, Mother Nature can definitely be a force to be reckoned with. So tell me, you have been traveling now for a couple of years. Your one year turned into two years and then nine years later. But somewhere along the line, you started taking pictures and you became a travel photographer. Can you tell me about your journey to taking pictures? So when I started traveling, I, the goal was to take some pictures so I have something to hang in my house when I was done with my trip. Okay. So I bought a camera that was way over my head that I didn't know how to use. 
<laughs> and I started taking some really bad pictures. Like they're and they're still up on my website. You go to my photos from Hawaii 2007. They're there. You can see them, and they're just hideous. They're they're awful, awful photos. <laughs> and you know, even like the first, still the first several years from from my travels, I don't even like showing those pictures anymore because they're so bad. But I realized, well, I, my intent when I started was to do a video podcast. And at, in 2007, it was difficult. There was no Google Hangout. There was no YouTube. Uh, or at least it wasn't really a thing. You couldn't buy cameras where you could store the video in memory. Everything still had to be on tape. Uh, they, they, they came out later that year, but you know when I started, I think Sony had an expensive one with a hard drive in it or something. So I had all these tapes, and I remember I was in Fiji, and I was doing this thing where I interviewed someone, and it was such a pain to be doing the editing and doing the video work and everything, and doing it on a laptop in a place with crappy Wi-Fi, that I eventually just kind of said, I'm going to, I'm not going to do the video. I'm going to focus on still photography. And so I did that and I started posting a photo every day on my website starting in November, 2007. And uh, it was just an iterative process of getting better and better. And so I went from a complete novice who knew nothing about the camera. And uh, so I've been named travel photographer of the year in the United States now or in North America uh, three times. The most recent being uh, was named for 2015 by the North American Travel Journalists Association. Congratulations. I have downloaded your 100 your 100 page 100 picture book, your e-picture book. And I'm going to encourage I'll put that in right say that right now um, to go to Gary's website everything everywhere.com and he offers a beautiful picture book of his travels. There are 100 beautiful photographs in there. And I live vicariously through them. You know, I'm like, yes, I'm going to travel here, and I'm going to visit that place, and I'm going to look at this, you know, be right here, and behold the same view. So it's really very inspiring and really great work. What was it about the photography that turned you on, that you said, you know what, I think I can do this? Well, I think it, the inspiration for it came from reading and collecting National Geographic magazines over the years because they're known for such good photography. And it was really just kind of an iterative process. I went from, you know, I'd look at a photo and I was like, oh, I wish I could do that. And then I went to, well, I wonder how they do that. And then I kind of figured out how they did that. And then I got to a point where I was, yeah, I could do that. And it's a... You know, a lot of people, they, they try to teach photography, and it's a very tricky thing. There are certain technical aspects to it, which certainly you have to know. It's a lot like knowing the keys on a piano, but knowing how to do the, the scales on a piano doesn't make you a concert pianist. And knowing all the settings on the camera are just the starting point. It's a tool that lets you, that lets you do what you want, and you need a vision of something many times before you actually can create the image you want. And that's... I think one of the keys, and I think also learning how to edit photos. That's something that most people completely ignore. Um, you know, Ansel Adams didn't just click a shutter. He spent a lot of time in the dark room to make a photo come out exactly the way he wanted it. And you know, one of his sayings is, you don't take a photo, you make a photo. And today the same is true in working with tools like Lightroom, that you need to be able to, the, the image that comes out of a camera is often flat and boring and you need to be able to bring it to life to, to, to look like something that you actually saw. Wow, that's an amazing interpretation of photography. You know, I've, I've, you know, I see, there are photographs that I see and you get a feeling, you know, they convey this feeling. But I've never heard anyone express it so beautifully. You know, it's you, it's like photography romanticized. That was a beautiful um, expression. It's very well, artistic. When I went to Antarctica, I did a lot of research looking at photos of Antarctica. Um, and one of the, the photos that I, I saw, I had a list in my head of, of things I wanted to photograph. And one of them was I wanted to get a picture of a penguin jumping off an iceberg. Um, now, of course, I would have to actually see that in order to be able to <laughs> photograph it. And we, we, I didn't see this. There were no penguins jumping off icebergs. And the last hour we were there, we were tooling around in our zodiacs before we had to go back to the ship. 
And sure enough, there was this iceberg with some penguins and they were jumping <laughs> off, climbing back on, jumping off, climbing and just doing this over and over. And I got a great shot of it. Um, so, you know, sometimes the opportunity <laughs> has to present itself. Sometimes an opportunity will present itself that you didn't know. I was in Haiti last year. And the thing with, with Haiti is that the, the, the girls, the school girls, well, everyone wears a school uniform and the young girls will wear large ribbons in their hair. And there were these girls walking home from school and we were in front of the San Sushi Palace, which is one of the most famous attractions in Haiti. And they were walking up the steps and I got a picture of these school girls with the big ribbons in their hair, walking down the steps of the San Sushi Palace. And the moment I saw that, the moment I saw it, I knew that that was a, a great photo. And sure enough, I ended up winning a gold medal uh, in a photography competition this year. And, but it wasn't something I planned, but it was something I was able to recognize the moment it happened. Wow. I grew up in Tobago, you know, Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. So I grew up in Tobago and I used to wear those big ribbons in my hair too. <laughs> you know, I, I've been to Trinidad, but I haven't been to Tobago yet. Oh, uh, that's the best part. But you know, one of the things I like about you know, a lot of people, when they think of Trinidad and Tobago, they will think of uh, steel drums, uh, they'll think of carnival and things. But one of the things I didn't know until I got there was the large Indian population. East I Indian. Had, I had no idea. And, you know, originally because of the British and they, they, they brought in workers and whatnot. And there were all sorts of things that I just didn't know. And you don't know about them until you get there. And... Um, you know, I went to the, the North Shore of Trinidad and had Bacon Shark and didn't know it existed, but it was fantastic. Went to the Pitch Lake um, and, and had a great time there. And, you know, one of, and I, I, that was the end of an island hopping trip. I started in Puerto Rico and I worked my way all the way down to Trinidad, visiting every country and territory along the way. So, um, you know, every Montserrat, Antigua, uh, Anguilla, St. Martin, Saba, St. Eustatius, uh, St. Vincent, St. Saint, uh, Saint Lucia, uh, Guadalupe, uh, Martinique, Barbados, where I almost got kicked out of the country, uh, <laughs> Grenada, um, and they're all kind of different, right? They're, there's a similarity, but they all have their own little uh, peculiar things about them, and, um, you know, it's a fascinating part of the world. And I think too many people, they just go to like some sandals resort in Jamaica and they don't bother to actually experience the Caribbean and to understand the culture and, and how it came. And there's a lot of ties between the Caribbean and the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, we have similar colonial histories and uh, a lot of people just aren't aware of a lot of that. Yeah. Well, you've got to go to Tobago. Tobago is the hidden treasure. Well, they told me that's really kind of where a lot of the tourists go because that's where the, the Tobago? beaches. Well, in terms of like beaches and stuff. The beaches are yeah. better than Trinidad. <laughs> Trinidad, the waters tend to be very rough the way where the island is located in Trinidad. In Tobago, there are more white sandy beaches and the water on certain parts of the islands, depending on the time of year, you know, tends to be a lot calmer. Yeah, and that's one of the few islands I, had, I didn't get to, and I would love to go back. Okay. You've got to go there. So now, you know, you, you've you discovered your passion for traveling. Within traveling, you've discovered your a love for photography. I mean, you're looking at those National Geographic's books when you were small, magazines when you were small, you know, you are now part of this, that you are now creating this world and you are now living in this world. How did you decide, or not decide, but how did you discover that you can make a living doing this, doing what you love? So I was about nine months into traveling. So to back up a bit, so after I sold my original internet business, I started a company, uh, we had a, a network of video game websites and we had the primary site which we owned and then we also uh, sold advertising for a network of other sites. And at our peak, we had about, we were doing like 50 million page views a month wow. across our video game network. So I had an idea of what getting a lot of traffic meant and my site was not getting a lot of traffic. I could tell you the names of everybody reading my website. 
because there just weren't a lot of them. <laughs> and because I had a business background, I was thinking after doing this for nine months that this was either a waste of my time because nobody was paying attention or I needed to take this seriously and think of I could find a way to turn this into something. And I had nothing more than something. I didn't know what, there was no one else doing it at the time, there was nothing to model or base this on. And all I knew was, I knew nothing about travel and tourism, I knew nothing about publishing, I knew nothing about any of this stuff. I just knew it was, okay, if I can get an audience, eventually, I will be able to, money will come to me. Because that's, and I knew that the magazines and the newspapers would all eventually die, and that's becoming true, it's not totally true yet. Um, so I just sort of began taking it seriously and focused on developing uh, an audience and getting people to, to to pay attention to what I was doing and spending more time on social media. And I didn't make any money for the first, it was over four years, cl close to five years. I made no money doing this. I was all living off savings. and. Um, but eventually, what I predicted came true. The travel industry eventually warmed up and started to find reason to work with people like myself. And uh, today, yeah, it's, it's a very viable business. But it took a lot of time. So, Carrie, I'm beginning to notice some things about you here. You were an entrepreneur already. You had your own business. You were in the technology technology field. You are visionary in the technology field. You sold your company. I mean, you were doing things that people weren't doing. I was early. Yeah. Yeah. So you were visionary. You know, you laid the groundwork for a lot of what's happening today. You decided you wanted to travel. You found, you know, it was an interest turned passion. And then, you know, you didn't even think about, there was no fear. And you for you to step forward and make this decision you decided you were going to do this for a couple of years then you just said you know i i'm going to figure out either i'm wasting my time or i'm going to figure out how to make money it took you four years and you did not give up on that dream you know there's some resilience there well stubbornness to it I might call it <laughs> why would you call it stubbornness i i think a lot of people and i and i've seen this countless times uh, they, it's like, oh, I'm going to travel and I'm going to start a website and then they give up after six months or a year because they didn't find success where you, you, a lot of success is just hitting your head against the wall over and over and over until something works. And, you know, you hear it all the time. People talk about, you know, I was a 10 year overnight sensation and they, they only see the success part, but they don't see all the stuff beforehand that goes into it. And I just, I love travel. So the goal was if I could find a way to just pay for what I was doing, I didn't have to be rich or anything, um, that that would be a success. And, you know, going back to this notion of not having fear, I think a lot of people, they're, af they're afraid to lose what they have. And so and it's not a political thing, but they tend to be very conservative that way. And I've never been that way. Now part of it has to do when I started traveling I had no family, no wife, no kids, um, no job that I had to worry about and, and I had some money stashed away obviously from the sale of my house and my business. So I certainly probably had some more freedom than a lot of people might have and a lot more flexibility. But by the same token uh, when I started my first business I never raised a single dime. I never took out a loan. I did it because I was the last person to get paid. I was the lowest paid person in the company up until I sold it. So basically I funded it through poverty. And when I traveled, I, you know, I saved a lot of money by staying in hostels and other really cheap places. And if you're determined, you will find a way to make something work. And a lot of people, they desire the success, but they, the determination to make it happen is often lacking. Very, very powerful. You know, I'd advise anyone who's looking at this to look at it again. Listen to it a few times. Those are jewels that you're dropping there because it's so very true. You know, and you you just 
have these qualities that seem to come out of you naturally that make you successful. What do you think you, you hinted on something a minute ago, but I'll ask the question specifically. What is it that you specifically think separates you from those who haven't? I, I tend to be pretty determined. Um, when I set my mind to something, it's then, okay, how is this, how do you make it happen? And it's always a series of small things that are iterative that, that get you towards that goal. And the other thing is, I, I, I do think I tend to maybe see things other people don't see. That, you know, if you see one thing, and, you know, if, if you see a, a small town, it's the visionary is going to say, okay, this one day could be a country. And some people can say, no, it's just a small town. Well, yeah, but you have to have vision to see what it can be. And too many people only see what something is, not what it can be. And if you look at any big company, not even, not, and we're not even talking about business, but any enterprise, whether it's a social movement, it starts with something small, but someone has to have vision to see what it can be and grow into. And I, I think I've always been pretty good at that, to have an idea of what something can be or, or what the potential is. Do you get crystal clear, you know, on what it is you want to do? You get an idea. How do you then take that idea and process it into a business? Uh, you know, um, you know where I'm going with. I don't. I, one one mistake people make, I think, is that they have they get too stuck in like a business plan. You don't. I don't, I don't have a plan. I have a goal or at least a direction. The goal is that way. And if you think about it, let's say you're, you're trying to, to take a cross-country hike. I want to get to point B, and you're going to have all sorts of obstacles. You're going to have to climb over some trees. You're going to have to go across a stream. You're going to have to go uphill. You're going to have to do all this stuff. You might not know what you're going to encounter along the way. Uh, you might encounter a bear, which means you've got to go around it. You have to do something else. And so you can't plan for any of that. But you have to be able to adapt. And you know, one of my favorite sayings when it comes to travel is the ability to adapt is more important than the ability to plan. And I think that's true in business and life as well. You should have a goal. You should have a direction that you're trying to go. But the plan is going to get thrown out day one because something's going to happen. And that something may not may be good. It might be bad. It could be an opportunity that lands in your lap. And a lot of times people see people that are successful and they say, we got lucky. Well, you know, I was lucky insofar as I started a business with the internet back in 1994, right? That was at the ground floor of a lot of that. But there were several billion people on earth back in the early 90s. So it, there was a lot of people that could have done something similar, but they didn't. So the opportunity was there and there's opportunities right now. Um, I was relatively early with, with doing a travel blog. Um, but I certainly wasn't the first, and there were many people who started it around when I did, and they have since mostly given up. And the reason I think I've stuck with it is, by and large, determination and stubbornness. Okay. You get an award for that. <laughs> A human award. <laughs> you know, an award that inspires, you know. It inspires it inspires me it's touched me I'm completely amazed and fascinated that you know you can you know people have dreams of like freedom and you know doing things living their passion and some of that you know in that they there is a sense of safety and stability somewhere in there you know but for you it's about just exploring the variety and as the things come up, as the bears come in the way in the streams and the valley, it's about being able to adapt. It's about, you know, and that is amazing and that is very different and it's great to see that and know that, you know, that can happen for you if there's someone who secretly wants to do that. Maybe they don't know how. Maybe maybe they think it's wild and crazy. But here you are, you know, doing it. You found a way. You stuck with it, and you are living an amazing life because you're living it on your terms. Yeah, you know, I think some of it also has to do with the fact that I'm very confident that if the worst should happen, 
let's say I lose all my money in some endeavor or something, um, I can always go get a job. I know I'm, I have talents. I know that um, that is always an option that's available to me because I, I, I think I'm pretty good at certain things and I, you know, somebody somewhere would probably recognize that. Um, even if I ended up working at a McDonald's, I'm pretty damn sure that within six months I'm gonna be the manager. And if you have that sort of attitude, it frees you up because it, you're not scared, you're not acting from a point of not trying to lose something, but actually trying to gain something. And there's a huge difference, and there's a big, you know, it, the, the trade-off between risk and reward is real. You have to risk something if you wanna gain something. And there's a lot of people, they, they, they dream big, and they, they want to be successful, but they don't wanna risk the things that are necessary to achieve that success. And I don't care what, whether it's, you know, you, you listen to like certain artists. Um, I've heard stories about when Kanye West, before he was successful, was just, you know, he was the cockiest guy and he'd go to these parties and he'd say stuff and he knew he was going to be successful even if everyone else thought he was full of crap at the time and turns out he did. And there's so many stories of that that if, if you have that attitude and you just keep pounding away and keep pounding away and keep pounding away, that you can eventually make something and it, it, it could, be in sports, it could be in music, it could be in anything. I've heard stories of, you know, uh, actors. So many people go to LA, want to make it big, and the ones who do are the ones who really are determined that they're going to more auditions than everyone else, and, you know, they'll, they're willing to take anything in order to, to, to keep working, and yeah, there's a lot to it, and that's what you got to do. Thank you for that. So tell me, Gary, what is your most memorable travel experience? It's, it's very difficult to pin it down to one thing. Um, there's so many that I could fall back on. Um, what about your funniest? Funniest? I don't know, I was actually, uh, when I was in Thailand, the way the Thai language works is that, it's like in English when we refer to men and women, we say he or she basis on who we are talking about. But in Thailand, you will say things like uh, hello or whatnot based on who you are. So the way a man says hello is different than the way a woman says hello. Uh, so a woman would say swati ka, a man would say swati kap. And I, had, I was saying hello and thank you like a woman for like a month. <laughs> And no one had actually bothered <laughs> to tell me about this. And eventually I figured it out. And I was, I see there were these, the place <laughs> I was staying, there were these Thai people who were, you know, running the, the restaurant and that stuff. And I was eating there every day. And I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me this? And it's like, oh, if you're foreign, we don't really care. We get it. <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> so, do you have from your travels a favorite type of food? Oh sure, uh, it'd probably be Japanese. Okay. And uh, with a close second being Argentine. Oh wow! Asado, okay. uh, beef and barbecue in Argentina, I think, is the the best in the world. If you're a vegetarian or if you're a vegan, especially, just don't even bother. Just just don't go to Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> it's all okay. Just, Okay. When you go to Tobago, you have to try the curried crab. Curried crab and dumpling. Curried crab and dumpling. I will I will absolutely yes. do that. You do. Okay. So what do you do to unwind and relax? Uh, you know, a couple months ago, I actually finally got an apartment. So I stopped traveling full time. I still travel quite a bit. I just got back from Ethiopia a little over a week ago. Um, been in India and I go to, I'm going to the Balkans, Serbia and Macedonia in a couple of weeks. Okay. But while I was traveling full time, I would often go on what I called an anti-vacation, <laughs> which is basically I would just lock myself in a hotel room, eat junk food and play video games for a couple of days. <laughs> okay. So that's how you unwind? Yeah, it was basically because I'm in vacation mode almost all the time. And yeah, it can actually be really tiring traveling. Uh, I kind of realized that I have a limit of about 
four or five hours a day that I can be out exploring. Okay. That if you do more than that, you really get exhausted <laughs> running around and you kind of, you, you lose interest in things because you're, you're, you're so tired. And so I think that's a, you know, and you know, maybe it's like two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, you have lunch or something in between. And with that, you can focus, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's six hours if you break it up and put a break in there. Um, but you can focus and pay attention on things and kind of be interested and it doesn't feel like just such a slog visiting stuff. Okay. What is your favorite app? Favorite app? Um, it would probably be Google Maps, I guess. Uh, I use that all the time because it's, it's so handy. You know, the biggest change, so when I started traveling, I sold my house March 13th, 2007. That was in the short period of time between when the iPhone was announced and before it was released. So there were no iPhones, no smartphones when I started traveling. And I remember in November of that year, I bought an iPhone or an iPod Touch in Japan. And I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread because it replaced so much of the stuff I was carrying around. A uh, point shoot camera, a video camera, an alarm clock, um, a flashlight. Uh, I used to have a little Wi-Fi checker key fob thing that was the dumbest thing in the world, but I didn't need that anymore uh, now that I had this. Not to even mention things like a phone and, and a GPS. I used to have a GPS that I carried around. don't need that anymore. And so that solves so much. And what has not only have the phones improved since then, but now it's easier to get online everywhere. So if you're in the U.S. and you have a T-Mobile account, they do free unlimited uh, data roaming in 140 countries now. Wow. Which are most of the countries that people visit. Uh, was They didn't have it in Ethiopia where I just was. But... Um, so you can get, you can pull up a map, you can find a hotel or wherever you need to do. You can do translation with someone live. So it has completely changed travel. It's almost like cheating now. It's so easy. Um, if you, if you have a smartphone, a lot of your fears about traveling should disappear because you don't have to worry about getting lost. You don't have to worry about translation anymore. You don't have to worry about finding a place to stay because it can all be done with your phone. Amazing. That actually sounds like a great idea for a commercial, you know, showing that all these things you had to carry with you, they're now, they're now in a phone. Well, you know? the good folks at Apple computer know where to find me. So <laughs> you just gave them a brilliant yeah. idea. <laughs> okay. So hmm. who has been the biggest inspiration in your life? Um, the people that, that have inspired me the most are actually kind of, have nothing to do with travel necessarily. Um, Ted Williams, Boston Red Sox player, um, Vince Lombardi, I'm part owner of the Green Bay Packers, uh, grew up in Wisconsin, um, still living, uh, composer Philip Glass, I think he has a great story. You know, he's one of the, the greatest composers, I think, of the 20th century. Uh, still around, still composing. Never really made it as a, a success as a composer until he was 40 years old. He was driving a cab, doing plumbing, and working for a moving service, all until he eventually, you know, got Einstein on the beach, and it was uh, at the Metropolitan Opera, and suddenly he was a success. Not a lot of 40-year-olds, and that's basically when he started his career. I mean, he, he did some stuff before that, but um, I think a, and, and a lot of uh, the inspiration for what he did came from traveling. I read his biography, and you know, it involved going overland from, from Europe to India through a lot of places in Central Asia and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, and um, yeah. People like that. People like, and the reason I love Ted Williams so much is because he, he did something very simple, hitting a baseball. I did it arguably better than anyone else, but he was very deliberate and methodical about understanding how hitting a baseball worked, the science behind it, um, you know, the technique, and, and just getting it all down. And I think a lot of people think that becoming good at something like that, whether it's a sport or something, is just natural ability. And certainly there's a lot of natural ability, but 
Uh, a, a great example is uh, Steph Curry right now. You know, he's doing things uh, in, in basketball that no one has done. And when you read how he did this, he was a guy at a crappy, he didn't get recruited in college, went to a crappy school, didn't get drafted very high, and has methodically through practicing every day, taking 253 pointers a day, has become the greatest three-point three shooter ever by, by a wide, crazy margin than anyone else. And it's because he had the foresight to know, well, gee, no one is taking these shots. Maybe I could do it. Maybe I could become real good at it. So it wasn't just becoming excellent at something, but thinking of a different way to do it. And he's really de redefining what basketball is all about, I think. Maybe somewhat of a visionary, too, you know, come along and shake some things up in that field. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and you can see it in sports and music and other areas as well, where somebody comes along and does something fundamentally different, you know, than the people that came before them. And I think that that's, you don't see it that often, but, um, yeah, those are the, the kind of people I think you need to look up to. Yeah, they, they wake up our beliefs and show us what's really possible about what we can achieve when we really want it. You know, it's he's a, Roger Bannister. Is that the guy who broke the record? Ban I know Bannister is the last the four name. minute mile. The four yeah. minute mile. Yeah. He's those guys that just raise the bar. So tell me, bear or wine? Uh, now I would say wine. Okay. Actually, I would I would go with a third option, cider. I oh. became a big fan of ciders, especially uh, from northern Spain in the Basque region. And they're, they're fantastic. I, I went on a hunt to find Bosque Cider here in the Twin Cities. And I found one place that had it. And I went in and I bought them out of all their cider. <laughs> and so I have a, a stash of it. Um, <coughs> but it, it, it's great stuff. And there's other um, drinks as well that I've discovered. Uh, sparkling sake, like from Japan. We think of sake. There's cold sake and warm sake. But the sparkling sake is fantastic. And I had it for the first time a couple of years ago at a sushi restaurant in New York. And uh, I was just stunned at how good it was. Hmm. Okay. Football or basketball? Football. Okay. I mean, I, I'm actually, I should say, I'm not a football fan per se. I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. Whenever they're eliminated, my interest in football dies <laughs> until the next season. So. Okay. Okay. So, Gary, it is here, here at Lifestyle by Design. It's a tradition for my guests to leave viewers with action steps, three action steps that they could implement into their lives right away to start living their dreams. What advice would you give to someone who is desperately seeking to make a change, to live their dreams, move in a direction that they want to, but they're afraid. Maybe they feel stuck. Maybe they are anchored with fear. What advice would you offer them? What are you afraid of? That's the biggest thing. I think, like I said, a lot of people are afraid of losing what they have. And, you know, when it comes to travel, there's, a, there's more and more people doing this. It, it's becoming easier to travel. And there are more people. The Internet has changed so much. And people are shocked when they learn how little money it costs. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you got to be rich to travel. I know quite a few people, quite a few, who travel full time, meaning they have no home, on about $1,000 a month. Mm. That's $12,000 a year, which would be well under the poverty line. But what they don't know is that having a house costs a lot of money. Or an apartment. You got utilities. You got a car. You got insurance. You got a fuel. You got all this stuff that you have to pay for. And when you get rid of all of that, and let's say you go to an affordable country in Southeast Asia or Central America or someplace like that, uh, you can live quite well on very little money. You can get an awesome apartment in Bangkok for like four or five hundred dollars a month. Wow! Like a really nice high-end apartment. And if you don't want to spend that, you can get a, a much more modest place for maybe $200 a month. I have some friends right now in Mexico. They're living in Oaxaca, and they're spending about that much uh, for an apartment. And you're able to live 
quite well. You're able to work online doing any number of things. Uh, it could be some consulting or writing or different things. And even if you're only making a couple hundred dollars off that, uh, that might be enough to, to fund what you're doing. And again, I, I have so many people that say, well, yeah, you got to be rich to travel. It's like that, that thousand dollars a month is the lower end threshold, right? I've known some people that have done it for less, but let's just use that as a nice round number. And it can go up from there to the stars because you could stay at five star hotels and everything. Um, but you don't need to do that. And people look at the cost maybe of a package tour to Italy or something they see in the newspaper and they see the price and they say, well, if I extend that out for a year, it would cost a ton. Well, no, you're on a package tour. There's a tour operator. You're staying in nice hotels. You don't need to do any of that. Not to mention, Europe is a very expensive place to travel to. There are places that are much more affordable. And, um, you know, ultimately, you got to pull the trigger. And if you want to travel, you can sit and dream about it and say, one day I'm going to do it. Rather, what you should do is mark a day on the calendar, let's say one year from today or, or whatever, and say, this is the date I'm going. Go buy a ticket for that date, a one-way ticket from here to wherever, and just go do it. And once you put yourself in that position that this is going to happen on this date, it ceases being dreaming about when it can happen. And now it's, okay, how the crap am I going to make this happen? And you're thinking, your thought process changes, and you're, you're in a different mode, not of dreaming, but of, of problem solving. And uh, problem solving is how things get done. But I wouldn't let, you know, I have a lot of friends who are single females, and they travel. And I get women that say, well, you know, if I travel by myself, isn't it dangerous? No, it doesn't have to be at all. I know a lot, a lot of women who do it. Um, doesn't make a difference your ethnic background or anything else. Uh, yes, you do need some money to travel, obviously. You, do, you need that to live. Uh, but it's much less than people think. So if, if you don't have a passport, like right after this interview ends, go start getting a passport. It's trivial to get. I think it's like 70 or 80 bucks. You take a picture, you fill out a form, boom. You get yourself a passport, and that's your ticket to then pretty much do uh, to go anywhere in the world. And the American passport will get you to more countries without a visa than any other passport on Earth. So there's really not an excuse. Okay. Thank you for that. And I want to thank you for spending your Tuesday night here with me and my audience and sharing the wealth of information, your experience, your lessons learned. Um, and I, I honor you for stepping up and living your dreams and going for it and not letting anything hold you back and just being able to figure things out along the way. You are an inspiration. And I wanna thank you for that. You're welcome. So everyone check out Gary's website. It is amazing. He's got amazing pictures. Uh, you will hear the latest. You'll be able to keep up with him. He has a podcast, it's four, um, that you'd be able to keep up with what he's doing and where he is in the world. And it's a pretty amazing website with lots of details and lots of fun adventures that he has made throughout the last nine years and is continuing to do. So it's everythingeverywhere.com. All the information is there and you can learn more about Gary there. So Gary, thank you. There's one more thing that I wanted to mention. There was another first. I never met anyone with a huge National Geographic collection. <laughs> you said you have quite a huge collection. Yeah, it's one of the, the biggest on earth actually. Um, I own a, an original unbound copy of issue one, number one, which was uh, released in 1888. Wow. And I also own, um, actually I do, Hold on one second, I can show you. This. Sure. So this, only 500 copies were ever made of this. This is a mm -hmm. copy, so wow. Machu Picchu um, was made famous by a guy named Hiram Bingham, who went on a National Geographic expedition in the early 20th century. And Yale University Press made 500 copies of this, which was the original um, kind of all of the, the results and the photographs from that journey. And uh, I own one of them, one of the, the, the better copies of it. And this is, uh, the, it initially took place between 1911 and 1915. And uh, this is one of them. And 
one of my prized possessions. And a lot of people don't realize that this was the expedition. National Geographic never ran photos until this. It was actually a, wow. yeah, it was more of a, a, a literary, a scientific journal. And uh, it became popular when they started showing pictures of Machu Picchu and they started showing pictures of other places and that's what it became known for. Wow, that's amazing. That is impressive and amazing. And thanks for that information too. I did not know that. So that's good to know. That's a good fact to know. So again, Gary, thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. And for our guests, thanks for listening. I am Margaret Wilshire. If you thought this podcast was amazing, because it was, you can subscribe to my channel, like, comment, and share with your friends. Share with someone who wants to live their dreams and not sure how. Maybe someone who wants to travel, but they're afraid. Or they want to know more about travel. They can follow Gary over at his website. So thank you guys. And until next time, design a life that you love and go out there and live it. Thank you.